I'm doing the research because I feel that that is what keeps your academic brain alive. Like you, you, you continue to keep tabs on the knowledge edge. I mean, as, as an academic, you just have a fascination of where are things going? You know, what, what cool things can be done that haven't been tried before with this knowledge? I, I do think that um, there is a risk of sort of staleness if, if, um, if you don't remain engaged in that space. If I taught now what I was teaching three, four years ago, I would be shortchanging my students. So, so to actually keep up with what's happening in the space is, is very important. And research gives you that naturally without having to do, you know, research into how I'm going to teach this particular subject. Uh, I mean, you might have to do a little bit of that as well. Because education has such an important role in creating the future academics, the future researchers, the future workers in the space and whatnot. Um, there is a there is a science or a knowledge about how we go about training our engineers. And I guess historically, maybe we have thought that, oh, because we can do engineering, then it means that we can teach engineering, right? The recognition that we've just got on that systems engineering work actually suggests that, no, sometimes you do need to spend dedicated time thinking about how you're going to do a good teaching job in your field, which is different from teaching job in, in a different field. And um, yeah, and, and that's a type of research as well. And so I guess as an institution, we haven't done a lot of that historically, but perhaps this recognition and the national interest that's coming from some of these noises could be a, a prompt, I guess, to be a bit more courageous at investing resources in, in, in having some research leadership in relation to the unique way in which we do teaching. And one of my PhD topics was um, automatic administration of pharma pharmaceutical drugs. So essentially thinking of systems that can monitor a bunch of vital parameters of a patient and detect that they need a certain dose of a drug and adjust that dose accordingly. When I finished my PhD, I actually then went on being chief technical officer for a United States startup that was developing a blood pressure control system. And they were looking at using some of these control algorithms I had developed in their, in their machine. And as, as a result of that, they had collected a bunch of patient data, they're doing experimental trials and whatnot. And um, one day I was talking to my colleague, Mani Shaw, who is a systems engineering lecturer, and she was saying, oh, I need a project where we can do data analysis uh, and modeling applied to sort of a real world engineering case. Do you have something in biomedical? And I was like, well, <laughs> I said, I can give you data of about, you know, 100 patients who have undergone controlled administration of drugs. And there's a hypothesis that these drugs behave according to a certain model uh, of response. Um, I said, um, the students could investigate that and see if this modeling hypothesis is well-founded or not founded. And then I talked to my colleagues over in the US, one of them was an anesthesiologist. He gave the students a little workshop and explained to them all about what it is like to manage a patient's blood pressure during a surgical operation. And then he said, de-identified data, there's no intellectual property secret attached to this you can play with that and see if you can, you know, uh, see if the drug modeling that's been done in the research literature for this drug actually responds to the patient's actual behavior. And of course the answer is yes, to some extent, but it's a human biological system. So, you know, again, confronting the students with the idea that it's a model, it works broadly, but it's not perfect and you have to deal with variability and uncertainty. And, and so, yeah, that was quite a clear example that went from my research, which I published stuff on, to entrepreneurship industry exposure back to a student project that was done in a second year, second year classroom, right? Um, another year I gave my students in third year who were doing simple circuits with microprocessors. So they had to do something that did a little bit of data collection and analysis kind of in real time. And so, you know, having worked in biomedical signals, I thought, why don't we create like a little heart monitor, you know, and so I got our 
technician Erasmus to mock up a little um, electronic sort of sensing circuit, and then the students could quite readily plug that uh, plug their solution into this and and then test you know their algorithms and whatnot. And um, you should have seen the face of the students when one day I showed up to classroom with this little box and I said, oh, this is for your second project. And by the way, it's actually a heart monitor. And then I had walked into class with a couple of dots on me. So I clicked the whole thing in and I said, so there's my heartbeat. <laughs> By the end of the project, I want you to give me some analysis metrics out of, out of this trace, you know, my heart rate and my heart rate variability and whatnot. Again, bringing things I had been exposed to professionally and uh, in, some, in, in research to, to the students. And they can say, oh, cool. I can do this in a third year course or I can do this in a second year course. You can see how this is, is really exciting for them.